Well, thank you, Melanie. It's really a pleasure to be back in this room. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to try and convince you of a few things. I'm going to try and convince you that we have a credibility crisis in computational science, and I'm going to try to convince you that the right thing to do about it is to be more open and transparent about what we're doing as computational scientists. Okay, so let me motivate this. Um, the first thing that I wanted to say, I think this is not going to be news to anyone in here, is that science, is, the way we do scientific research is changing radically because of enormous amounts of data. And so, the, so I've actually, I've used this slide in a talk before and I was corrected that three terabytes a year for genome sequence data production vastly underestimates what's actually coming out. It's much more than this and this slide's wrong. So you guys probably know more about this than I do. Actually, I would appreciate updated data as you do know. But, um, but another one that, that I have more confidence in is, uh, so you know, even three terabytes a year is an enormous amount of data for us to process as a scientific community and for people to deal with. Um, at the, a linear accelerator in um, Switzerland and France, a CMS project, uh, 300 events per second events, they're just sort of picking up data points and they're running 5.2 million seconds, they're getting five megs per event, so they're coming up with nearly 800 terabytes a year. Um, they process the data and then they end up with several petabytes a year that they need to somehow work with. So this is, you know, a small problem, but they're producing enormous amounts of data. I, I just took a look online, digital, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, their eighth data release from last year is 50 terabytes, so you know, just pictures of the sky that people can work with. So I'm sure any of you can conjure enormous amounts of data that scientists have been running into. I would imagine that in your line of work you're seeing more data coming your way, more uh, bigger studies and, and more data. So, um, so that's one, one change that's happening. Another thing that's happening with our you know, societal hobby of data collection is we're also using this increased computational power to um, make use of simulation as a tool of research. So massive simulations of the complete evolution of a physical system, systematically varying parameters. This is really a new type of scientific investigation and discovery, the ability to simulate systems like this. So these are two deep changes and you can see sort of across the scientific landscape that computation is creeping in and I'll have some examples in a moment. Um, a core change I think it's happening as a corollary to these two changes is the third point here, that we're really getting our intellectual contributions, often very deep contributions, actually embedded in the software that people are writing. So um, details with how data were analyzed and how results came about, you don't really find them in the same detail in the paper as you do in the code. And so now we've got stuff embedded in code, and what are we doing with that? And this stuff, this is, this is what we're about, right? And now it's in the code. Okay. Um, all right, so David Donahoe is my advisor and, uh, at Stanford, and he has postulated in a joint paper these different branches to the scientific method. So he's arguing that um, all this computation and all the changes that I just described, perhaps they're comprising a third branch of the scientific method. So the way that, the way that people think about it, and one way to think about it, is the first branch of the, the scientific method um, is really about deductive logic, and we can recognize that from the times of the Greeks and so on, and um, how do we actually um, add contributions to knowledge to a deductive system. The second one, empirical, so this probably, I, I would argue, um, although there's some evidence historically maybe came in the 1300s, 1400s, something like this, starting to think about, well, if we're doing empirical work, how do we really um, develop standards for this? So we have statistical analysis, controlled experiments, and other things we might do. And so this, this, so this idea that how we do scientific research can change is not new. So we've already seen this change from the deductive to the inductive branch. So there's lots of talk um, these days that maybe all this computational stuff, the fact that we can do these simulations, the fact that we've got data-driven research, maybe this is comprising a third branch of the scientific method. Maybe there are really deep changes going on here with these large-scale simulations. So um, Donahoe's not the only one to postulate this. So this set us thinking um, in terms of, well, what really qualifies something as a branch of the scientific method? What does the scientific method mean when you're trying to do computational science? Fundamentally, 
uh, we believe that the scientific method is about rooting out error. It's not about transmission of scientific results. It's not about understanding something. I mean, really, it's a layer deeper than that. And what we're trying to do as scientists, in some very fundamental sense, is um, convince each other that the work that we've done, we've really done everything we can to root out error. And it's open to skepticism. And if there's something I've missed, maybe you can find errors in my talk or whatever it is. And that's you know, a core part of the scientific dialogue. So this is something that's been put into play in the first two branches of the scientific methods that are each hundreds of years old. They've had lots of time to think about this and come up with solutions. So the first one, they've solved it with the idea of a proof. You can't publish a mathematical result without a proof. I mean, everybody just accepts this, right? It would be laughable for me to try and submit something without a clear explanation of how I got there. And there's very clear standards for that, right? Anyone who's ever taken a math class with proofs knows that you got to hit those standards on the head for that to be accepted as a proof, and then your contribution um, actually accepted as, as a contribution to that deductive system. In the empirical branch, there are similar standards, right? Not as tight as in a deductive system as a proof, but we have our entire machinery of hypothesis testing. We have um, uh, controlled experiments. We have a very structured way that we communicate methods and protocols. Everyone here is familiar with the methods section in papers, right? Like there's a clear way that we're going to communicate this. Um, the argument that we try and make is that Computational science hasn't yet figured out what these standards are for this particular branch of the scientific method. And we're arguing without these standards, computational science doesn't count as a third branch of the scientific method yet. Right? It's, it's a little unfair. These have had hundreds of years. This is like two decades at the most old. But this is something that needs to come. Right? So, um, so the idea would be to have the same standards, the same um, priority on rooting out error such that others can replicate your work and understand how you got the results that you got as a computational scientist. So I threw this really should be a footnote, but building on Melanie's comment, um, other people have been thinking about this, like Ioannidis with the, his why most published research findings are false. He's getting at these similar questions about scientific communication. Okay, so I'm a statistician. So what I did to try and understand what's happening in scientific communication, I looked at one of our flagship publications, the Journal of the American Statistical Association. I went back to June 1996, and um, a little under half of the articles, yeah, a little under half of the articles were computational there, and none of them talked about where you can get the code, for example, to try and replicate or understand those results. Fast forward 10 years later to 2006, almost all of the articles are computational now, 33 or 35. And some of them are talking about where I can get the code. They just had to, I think the standards for where to get was extremely lax. They just pointed me to a website or mentioned this in some way that I gave them credit for it. So I was really trying to be inclusive. Okay, 2009, everything published in the June issue is computational now, at least even if it's a mathematical proof, they've got a computational example or something in the paper. 16% told me where to get it, and then the uh, June issue that just went by, again, everything's computational. It looks like we've kind of settled on this, that it's going to be computational if you're publishing in the statistics journal. And now we're up to 21% telling me where I can get the code if I wanted to replicate the work. 21% is a lot better than zero, right? We're certainly doing better, uh, but it's really not good, right? Like one out of five papers is telling me where I can replicate this. Four out of five, who knows, right? We're still publishing our computational work with that old protocol from the second branch with the methods section, talking about um, our procedures and our steps. And if you've done computational work, you know that this is something where um, you're just not going to get all the information that went into your coding and all the decisions you made into that paper. Victoria, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you just clarify what you mean by a computational article? Like, just give like two examples or something? Yeah. Did, it's easy. did you use the computer to get your results? Okay. Okay. That's all I mean. So, so it could be, you know, I've got a data set, I'm going to analyze it, and I used SAS to get my numbers. That's a computational paper. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you're doing anything there with data. So once you start using the computer to generate your results, you're adding this layer of opacity for your readers, 
right? Because there's different modalities there that are, I'm going to argue to you, that are more difficult to describe in the paper. So using the branch two method of communication doesn't necessarily include things like all your parameter settings, your invocation sequences for the different functions, like what did you use, what were the defaults in the program, um, all these different things that you would need if you were going to actually understand what those numbers meant or those results meant in the paper. Okay, all of this we think is engendering a credibility crisis in computational science. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples. Okay, this is the first one. So, um, Melanie set this up very well when she talked about um, Keith Baggerly and um, the panel at ENAR. I think it was this summer. Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, so, there's so many of you are probably familiar with what happened, or what is actually still ongoing, happening at Duke with the clinical trial. So I'll give you a very brief rundown. So back in 2006-2007, um, award-winning papers were published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine, Nature Medicine, um, you know, very prestigious journals to be publishing in. Evidence of genomic signatures to guide the use of chemotherapeutics, I believe they had six drugs that they were looking at and um, they were able to use people's genome information to ascertain what drug you may be more responsive to in fighting your cancer. So this was extremely exciting, like it starts to touch on issues of personalized medicine and many holy grails in, in this area of research. Oh, and by the way, all of these sets have been retracted, so this is, this is really quite tragic. And there's more, I think there's like, um, there's more coming out there. Their work from Podens and um, Pody and Nevins is still under review. I think I, it's seven, but it may be more. Just this raft of papers has been um, just retracted and ongoing. Um, in any event, so back in 2007, um, three people, Keith Baggerly, Coombs Wang at MD Anderson Cancer Center at uh, UT Austin, were very excited about this work. And so there wasn't a sense that they thought there was malfeasance here. It was more an sense of, this is a very exciting result and we want to be able to do it too and we want to be able to contribute to this and um, let's figure it out. So they try and start with replicating the result. They find all sorts of flaws. So of course I wasn't involved in this work and um, there's been papers published and it's just somewhat astounding. If you ever get a chance to hear Keith talk about it, it's worth it. Things like genes in control group and treatment group don't match. And things like um, they've clearly done something like taking data from Excel and put it in R and not worried about the header and now things are off by one. You know, just things like this. They have flipped labels on um, drugs. It's just like these sort of crazy errors. That, you know, again, if you do any kind of computational work, it's also, like, I'm not making excuses for this, but it's easy to do this stuff, right? Like, we all sort of make mistakes when we do computation. Um, and there's more, like, it goes on. It's, it's, it's astounding. If you're actually interested, I can point you to links because uh, this stuff's now, there's, there's records on it and, and what's happening. Um, if you want to have nightmares about the quality of the work we're publishing. Um, Okay, so Coombs, Baggerly, Wang, what they did is they wrote correspondence to the publishing journals, as probably everyone here would if you had find, you, you studied some work that's published and you find serious flaws in it. Um, correspondence supplementary report um, submitted to Journal of Clinical Oncology, they declined to publish. Nature Medicine declines to publish. They just don't think what's being pointed out is a problem. Um, in the meantime, 2007, the work's high impact enough, like I said, it was award winning. They start clinical trials at Duke. There are also Moffat clinical trials, which I think were terminated. I'm not exactly sure what happened to them, but they do start a series of three clinical trials at Duke. Now, this started to um, get enough attention when it was happening at um, Anderson Can Cancer Center. Duke launches an internal investigation two years later in 2009 and suspends the trials based on information it's getting about the quality of the research that underlies the trials. Um, and then something else weird happened in, in, in terms of communication. The, some, some information seems to be, have been withheld from the Duke committee that was evaluating, or it may have been an independent committee, but the committee that was evaluating the clinical trials. Um, I, I, apparently Nevins didn't hand over some of the work that um, Bagley and co-authors had done to the committee. And they start, restart the clinical trials again. 
they argue that some of the data is blinded, it turned out not to be blinded, and so on. But point is, there's so many fine details here in all of this computational work. Okay, clinical trials resumed at the beginning of last year. Patients were actually allocated to treatment and control groups. Um, neither the review nor the raw data are being made available at this time. Duke doesn't want to explain its decision and how it actually came to the decision that it's okay to go ahead with the trials. In July, in the middle of the year, 33 prominent biostatisticians, including you know, my old, some of my old professors from Stanford and someone like Brad Efron, they write to Harold Varmus, who had just become director of NCI, urging suspension of the trials and examination of standards of review, including reproducibility. So they're actually using the word like, how do you replicate these published results? If we can't replicate it, we need to look at what's going on and why. Um, in September, Institute of Medicine convened a committee review of omics-based tests for predicting patient outcomes in clinical trials because of this letter, because of what was happening at Duke. Um, and then they start meetings, and I think they've had seven meetings now, and it's still ongoing, because it's still an open issue. In November of 2010, the pressure is on Pody Designs, clinical trials are finally terminated. So, um, as a footnote here, Pody didn't resign under pressure about the actual science itself. What happened is they found that he had been calling himself a Rhodes Scholar when he applied for NIH funding on his resume and so on, and uh, he wasn't. <laughs> the Rhodes folks had never heard of him. And so this was sort of what pushed it into the New York Times, but before that, like all of us as scientists would have been already aghast at what's happening, but somehow, you know, a little line on the resume about being a Rhodes Scholar, then everybody freaks out, right? But everything else is just okay. But, um, but anyway, so, so Pody does end up resigning. They do terminate the clinical trials. Um, Finally, so I have a little more to say about the timeline, but um, but I wanted to just make a few more points. Okay, so that letter that the biostatistician sent to um, Varmus, I won't read the whole thing, but there's there. Well, maybe I will. <laughs> we seriously, we strongly urge that the clinical trials in question be suspended. So this is directly about the Duke issue. This wasn't the state of science is wrong. We should be doing more to show people what we're doing. Um, we need independent review of both clinical trials, the evidence predictive models being used to make cancer treatment decisions. Now, why? We need sufficiently detailed data and annotation that has to be made available for review. So, Baggerly and his colleagues at MD, Answer, MD Anderson Cancer Center actually coined a term forensic bioinformatics for the work that they had been doing. So the reason they could um, actually even try to replicate some of this results is because of course the enormous history in the genomics community about sharing of genomic data. So they were able to get their hands on some of the data. And uh, I don't think they had any of the code and so that's the forensic part. They were trying to reconstruct these results. Okay, the data should be sufficiently documented for provenance to be uh, assessed. Computer code used to predict which drugs are available or I mean, which is suitable for particular patients must be available to allow an independent group of expert genomic data and analysts. Not even, they're, not even, they're not talking about like opening it up to the public. They're just, you know, people who know what's going on need to be able to have a look at this stuff and assess its validity and reproducibility using the data supplied. So, in my opinion, that's quite strong language. And um, Science published a letter, so it's you know it's freely available online, or I can send you a link if you're interested. Um, so, so this was strong, and this was what got people thinking and got that that um, committee together to look at what's going on. So here's the web page for the committee itself at Institute of Medicine. Um, activity description, reviewing the published literature. So it's evaluation criteria for tests based on omics, so like genomics, proteomics, so on. Um, oh, they've got tons of them listed. Um, that's used as predictors for clinical outcomes. So they're very worried about um, clinical trial design and when, how, and who authorizes these clinical trials and on what basis. Okay, so more has happened in Duke. So there was an IOM committee meeting on August 22nd. Duke came to say their side of the story. Um, there has been two lawsuits filed now by patients. So patients who were assigned in treatment and control groups were actually given drugs based on these off by one row um, studies and so on. So this looks very, very serious. And um, many of the patients have now died. Um, uh, they were quite sick, they were cancer patients coming into the trials in the first place. And arguments uh, like that they're making, like the accusation of, um, they're accusing Duke of invalid and fraudulent science. 
um, deceptive meeting fra fraudulent conduct, to protect reputation, proprietary interest. I think there was a conflict of interest in one of the decision makers, I'll have to verify this, but one of the decision makers about the clinical trials was also a PI with this research and so on. Um, rather than protecting the safety of the patients involved in the clinical trials, this reduced the plaintiff's likelihood of surviving his or her cancer or the likelihood of experiencing a positive response to the chemotherapy regimen. Um, now, the courts will determine whether or not this is true, but this is how they're thinking, and there are, I think, 110 patients and um, probably more lawsuits coming. Victoria? Yeah. Um, about the lawsuits, is um, if you make a mistake, but, but it was unintentionally, it, that's a different category than if you make a mistake, but you cover it up. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. So I believe what they're bringing this under criminal statute, and I haven't actually looked, and I, I don't know, and the, the bar would be pretty high, like something like, um, you know, mistakes would be, I mean, the language they're using about fraud and deception and deliberate intent to do wrong. Um, but, I mean, I don't know what's going on in the IOM's committee's head, but I'm sure they're thinking about standards just like that, like also how do we protect and, I mean, if you don't want damage to happen from clinical trials, of course you can shut down all clinical trials, right? And so there has to be like, there has to be a balance. But anyway, so, but my point in putting this up here is just that people are a little inflamed. And it's not even the lawsuits that, I mean, that, are, that matter, it's, um, you know, I mean, we're playing with people's lives here and putting these clinical trials out, and uh, so what should the standards be? And the standards are reviewed for computational work that is published now in a very opaque way. Okay, so um, my argument is that our framing principle for how we communicate computational science really needs to be reproducibility. So uh, my advisor has this quote that gets um, repeated around a little bit, but I like it and I'll repeat it here. So he's talking about Reproducibility. The idea is an article about computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself. The publication is not the scholarship. It's merely advertising of the scholarship. The actual scholarship is the complete software development environment, the complete set of instructions which generated the figures. So this was 1998, of course, it has nothing to do with Duke per se, but you can see how if the people publishing um, the papers that led to the Duke clinical trials had been thinking more along these lines, the whole problem would have been avoided. Right? Things would have been open, mistakes would have been caught. So my simple definition of reproducible, so a result is reproducible if a member of the field can independently verify the results. So you're giving them enough information where they can go ahead and, and verify it. Okay. Okay, so my central thesis today Computational science must develop standards for reproducibility before it can be considered a third branch of the scientific method. So my approach to this and how we can get there is the data and code sharing with publication, allowing people who are in the field, knowledgeable, to replicate um, the results that computational scientists are, are publishing. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how policy affects what we're doing as computational scientists, the feasibility of reproducibility, and um, there are many, in, well, I hope you also find them interesting, developments on this front, not just what's happening at IOM, and this is, of course, um, policy coming up with criteria for um, authorizing clinical trials, for example, and what should these be in these computational studies, which is, of course, all policy decisions. So the first one to, uh, that I'm thinking about is um, the Bayh-Dole Act, which probably all of you are familiar with, passed in 1980. And um, what it did, of course, was, there, so it did two things. The first thing we wanted to do was harmonize um, policies of the different funding agencies. So one congressional act could make it so that if you're dealing with NIH, or you're dealing with NSF or DOE, your um, ownership over the um, potential commercializable output would be harmonized, right? There was a lot of confusion then. That's much less important than um, the other observation, which was, so remember 1980, these guys weren't thinking about computers at all, right? Like they just was just not something that was on the radar and they certainly couldn't be predicting it. They believed that there were lots of discoveries and inventions happening in universities that weren't getting to commercial development. And one of the problems is there was no incentive on the part of the researcher, the part of the institution to actually move that technology out. It didn't matter to them if it just languished in a lab because you know once the um, researcher had their publication, who cares, right? It was sort of the, um, 
the way they saw the problem. So what they did is they gave an incentive to universities to um, license that by giving universities ownership over this so that they could actually file patents and then accrue licensing um, fees from that. And so then they would, hopefully the idea was, um, make the technology available for commercialization instead of leaving it languishing in the ivory tower. So, um, so of course, so this, this is what developed things like, you know, tech transfer offices and so on that we never had before by goal. Uh, it's very interesting now to think about what that means in terms of software, right? So software often has patentable um, uh, invention type status. You can get a patent on software. Um, algorithms or um, other types of um, effects, I guess, whatever you want to call them, are embedded in software. And so now this becomes uh, a point of tension, right? Like, if we want to release our code and data in a way that it can be reproducible, so now we're, you could see that there might be a point of tension with the institution who wants to maybe put patents on this, or maybe there's startups, and um, you know, you just walk into any big school computer science department and the professors are like one hat entrepreneur, one hat professor, right? And a lot of this is going on with tech transfer offices. And I'm not necessarily being critical of it, but I'm saying that it's something that we need to reconcile in terms of reproducibility and in terms of scientific method. Um, one idea is, um, well, maybe the, the code can, can, the patented code can be licensed differentially for research versus commercial development, but I think there are subtleties here that are worth thinking about and, and worth bringing into the discussion. Okay, so patents, of course, even if you say, well, patents are open, there's still a delay in reading, in, in releasing code or closed code. Many researchers, if they're gonna patent their code or they anticipate they might be less willing to just throw it online, right, because of establishing prior art. Um, so Bilski was a case that the Supreme Court heard last year, and um, it was touted to uh, clarify patenting with business methods, right? And, but what happened is it was, Bilski was trying to patent um, an algorithm he had for asserting or ascertaining risk on financial instruments, I think it was, and they, he had code and he had implementations here. And the Supreme Court said, well, you're not, everyone up the chain said you're not entitled to the patent. And uh, one of the arguments they made for him not being entitled is that he had an addendum on his um, patent application where he said, well, here's the mathematics of the, the, what's in my code. And uh, they said, well, of course this is, can't be patentable. I mean, you've written the math. If you can write the math, this is an abstract idea, not patentable. You can't patent ideas, right? Just inventions. And so this is very strange when you think about this from a scientist, scientist's perspective. Suppose you are going to work with a tech transfer office and patent your, your code. Now you don't really kind of want to write that in clear mathematics, right? Which may be the easiest way to communicate this and the clearest way to communicate this. You suddenly got this incentive. Not that you don't already have incentives to obfuscate submitting um, a patent. But now, even in your research papers, maybe you don't really kind of want to just write it in a clear mathematical algorithm. So that's tragic, right? So there's some misalignment of incentives that's happening here at one level and happening for us. Okay. America Competes Act was reauthorized at the beginning of the year. And there's two pieces in here which are very interesting and um, to me show that things are moving in the right direction. So. There was, so the act mandates the creation of this interagency public access committee. So this committee is to coordinate federal science agency research and policies related to dissemination and long-term stewardship of the results of unclassified research, including digital data. So they're even talking about data. Many times when policymakers think about science, it's a discussion about the papers. Right? But there, there isn't a grasp of code and data as part of our outputs as scientists. Um, so they don't mention code there, but I'm not going to get picky. <laughs> they mention data, which is great. Peer and peer-reviewed scholarly publications support whole in part. The, so if you do federal funding, you need to think along these lines. Uh, if you get federal funding, um, so this is this is just I think very impressive for Congress to come up with language like that. I don't know what's going to come of it, but but that to me is a huge step forward. Okay, the next section, um, federal scientific collections. 
So it mandates that the Office of Science, Technology, Science and Technology Policy in the White House shall develop policies for the management and use of federal scientific collections to improve the quality organization access, including long-term access, uh, including online access and long-term preservations of such collections for the benefit of the scientific enterprise. Now the language sounds to me that they were talking about papers, right? They don't explicitly mention data again. But I think given this, you could argue that it includes data. And I like the fact also that they're understanding that we are in a web world as scientists now. It's not just the Library of Congress type stuff. At least not for us. Okay, so um, I wanted to quickly mention also funding agency policies that um, probably you guys are familiar with, particularly the NIH one. But NSF, for a long time, expects investigators to share with other researchers at no more than incremental cost, within a reasonable time, data, samples, physical collection, other supporting materials created or gathered in the course of the work. It also encourages grantees to share software and inventions or otherwise act to make the innovations they embody widely useful and available. So that doesn't preclude patenting, it doesn't, it's not a requirement, right, they're talking about encouraging, this isn't enforced, like if you have NSF money and um, it says it specs, but I sort of close down the data, I won't share it with anyone, I won't share anything with anyone, um, there's not really that much that really happens to me, I don't know of any case of anything happening, um, which is unfortunate. And the, the, but. In my interactions with NSF, I believe they, they know this, but the question is, well, how do you enforce this? Like, what are the standards? What if someone, did someone share their data appropriately or share their code appropriately? And if you start thinking about even in your work, if you've done computational work, what would you put online? What would you not? And what would you expect your peer to do who's working on similar papers? What would you like them to do? There, there's lots of nuanced questions about how you actually do it. And so this is, I think, the state of the debate now. How do we actually make this stick in a way that's not gonna scupper research that's productive and healthy and ongoing and not be an unfair burden. Okay, NIH is a little more advanced on these issues than NSF. Um, of course, Barmas came from NIH and implemented a lot of the openness policies that NIH actually has, including this one. The NIH endorses the sharing of final research data to serve these and other important goals, whatever they are, I did leave them. Uh, the NIH expects and supports a timely release and sharing of final research data from NIH supported studies for use of other researchers. It only applies to the big grants over $500,000, but still in 2003 they're talking about data release, right? And so here we are 2011 and we have the Duke scandal. Okay. Journals, another lever, right? So if you think about issues of sharing code and data, there's all sorts of pressure points that we're under, right? Um, funding agency policy requirements for grants are only one, aside from our, the earlier discussion on scientific integrity. What the journals require is certainly important. Um, you've probably seen lots of um, journals just pop up with supplemental materials. You can just throw it out there if you feel like it. They don't review it. it you know, could be porn, who knows, right? But it's a step, you know? So it's a good step. Um, data may, re I mean, journals may require data and or code to be provided upon request. So in February, Science published an issue with an editorial where they said, um, any paper we publish from now on, the authors need to release code, need to release data, you just need to email them and get it and it's upon threat of retraction. So if you don't actually get it from them, you know, just let your friendly science editor know and they'll push from the other side too. And so the idea is all the code and all the data and all these science articles is now available. Nature does it for data. They don't do it for code yet. Um, a couple of journals, biostatistics, biometrical journals, they've um, instituted a position as associate editor for reproducibility that can actually replicate results along with publication. It's an interesting question, um, I think. Um, at what point and who is responsible for reproducibility? At what point in the process? I think it's easy to come away from the Duke um, scandal and say, how could that have been published? That should have been reviewed, right? That's what peer review is for. Those mistakes should never have gotten out. On the other hand, this idea of reproducibility has never been something that's happened in the pre-publication stage. Historically, that's always been something that researchers have taken on, taken the instructions in the published communicated paper, it's what it's for, and then they go and they try and reproduce it, right? Or, you know, at least that's my fantasy that that mm -hmm. happened. But the idea was that there was no expectation before publication that they had to prove reproducibility. 
So, um, so I think there's a lot of people are playing around with these ideas. Journal editors are thinking about, well, how do I go? What are the steps? And again, the, it's like what NSF and NIH are facing. You don't want to sort of get in ahead of where scientists are and what's possible. So these steps like supplemental materials, I think, are important. Um, another thing that's happening, too, is open review process. So this is a little bit different, I think, in theme than what I've been talking to, to you about so far. But I think it, um, it's interesting in the journal policy discussion in terms of publishing um, review letters that were sent out and publishing responses anonymously. And so you can see actually what was fixed in the paper and so on. So there's another discussion about that. New journals are coming out, open research computation, open research computation, Biomed Central does data notes, research notes, so on. So trying to address issues of how do you publish computational work, how do you get credit for sharing data, and an that's another larger discussion. And many journals, of course, use the so far they're sitting in the wings, or at least that's what I like to think, that they're not just ignoring it. Okay, so I did, um, I'll finish up with uh, some very preliminary work that I'm doing on uh, journal policies. Uh, with a student in the summer, we looked at um, impact factor and took um, journals, in, information about journals from fields uh, um, created by ISI, so mathematical, computational biology, statistics, for multidisciplinary science. We tried to get ones where there was something computational going on, so there was some code and data debate to be had. We looked at 170 um, journals and what was their policy regarding code, regarding data, regarding reproducibility. Um, so here's the preliminary results, so uh, I think that the text is a little bit hard for you to read. But what we did is we classified them in five groups. Number five is they had no policy. So you can see that about 67% just haven't addressed the issue. And then what's interesting is what happened in the other 33%. Um, so one is, um, so this is just for data. Data is uh, required. This will, you won't get published there if you're not sharing your data, it really has an impact. So that's about 8%, 7.6, 7.7 7 there, 13 journals, that's, but that's more than I would have thought, right? Like that's more than zero. Um, two, it's um, required, but may or may not be enforced, right? They don't really tell you what's going to happen if you don't actually obey them, sort of like the NSF policy. And so that's 10, so that do that about 6%. Um, three, it's not required, but they'll review it, they'll host it. So this is the supplemental materials, maybe they'll have um, review going on there. So that's 5%. And then the surprisingly biggest one, not required, um, not reviewed, not host. Oh, okay, so not mentioned with either. Okay, so that's, it's not surprising that one's big. Okay, so we're seeing something happening here. So the work that, and so this is my student, Page Wan Guo. So he um, helped me with a lot of the work on this. So what we're seeing is this way that journals are sort of moving slowly and how they're adopting these policies. So this is, this is the point of our project. Okay, so this is not intended to be read. I just want to convince you that there's a groundswell all across the computational sciences um, from groups that are dealing with this. Applied mathematics, SIAM geosciences, ENAR, as Melanie, Melanie mentioned. Um, AAAS had a um, session on this, which Actually, I did, so it's a little bit <laughs> self-promoting there. But computational science and engineering, um, computer science, Sigma data conferences are requiring reproducibility, and then there's NSF work and IAM work that's, that's ongoing at the policy level. Um, my last slide, uh, I wanted to, with the blizzard of letters on the previous slide, hopefully convince you that there's a movement that's really developing over the last few years about these issues in reproducibility in computational science. Um, we're seeing more code sharing, more data sharing. Um, a lot of the discussion that I went through is about these interlocking incentives, how you need to get the federal policy aligned with funding agency policy, with the journal policy, with what's going on in the review and tenure committees and promotion and hiring committees at the institutional level and what's going on in the tech transfer offices. So there's all these different levers affecting the incentives on um, code and data sharing. One thing I didn't talk about separate is um, tools to do this, to make this easier. It's not easy to share your code. There's actually very interesting lots of work going on there that can't include it in the talk. And then I wanted to convince you that we have serious consequences in the short term, like people taking the wrong drug for their cancer, um, and in the long term, in how we establish scientific facts and, and the future of um, uh, the scientific method itself. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, a couple of comments. First of all, uh, a couple of years ago at a conference, I heard 
heard somebody talking about this sort of scandal uh, in Europe where somebody analyzed this data from some massive tests of high school students. And Germany did very poorly, according to this data analysis. Nobody could reproduce it, that analysis. Huh. Uh, and also, it was mentioned during this talk, something that I think we all know, sometimes it's very hard to reproduce your own analysis. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. The second point I want to make is how it seems like they can code readable by others. I mean, that's, you know, if somebody tried to read my code, they wouldn't let me know make any sense of it. It's a tremendous task to try to make code really easy to understand. I mean, like maybe 10 times harder than actually writing the code in the first place. So, so I have a couple of thoughts on that. So uh, that, that has occurred to me too. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I gave a talk actually at um, uh, Institute for Computational Science and Engineering at UT Austin. And what they do is look at scientific computing there. It's not just, um, well, I don't mean to say just, but they, but they have um, code bases of hundreds of thousands of lines long code. And what on earth does it mean to share that kind of code, right? No one's going to read it. And unless they're going to spend seven years going through, then it'll be outdated, right? Um, but so, so the so this, the second step is well, then maybe we don't need to require reading of code, even though the short scripts that I worked on as a grad student, it was very useful to be able to see exactly how those variables were made, or exactly what parameters were actually set, and so on. Um, but in many cases, it's not tenable. So then you get into um, things like, well, maybe there are tests I can do against the code, where I can hit it with certain things, and I know the outcome, and, and then I can sort of verify the code that way, even if I'm not actually going to look in it and read it. So I think there's there's still ways around, and I have um, presented that in something of a facile case. And it, as soon as you sort of start digging into actually applying it, all these things pop out, like the fact that it's not easy. Um, but this, if you if you look here, I did a uh, I co-organized a a workshop this summer and it was about building software for academics, computational academics, and how do you make it easier to share the code later, saving the steps as you go, or tracing the dependencies between your different, so you don't have to build that at the end, which is, I mean, you're toast by then, if you get to the end and you have to actually go back and basically redo your work. It needs to be something we do at the beginning and tools can really help and that's moving along. So, um, so I think your points are exactly right, but they're not necessarily gonna stop the movement. Well, I, I guess I have trouble with man and woman power here. I mean, where are these people coming from, and how are they being paid to mm -hmm. evaluate? Yeah, OK, so that's a Art. great question. Um, so it, this actually also talks a little bit to your point. Um, so one thing that, so if you look at things that are happening in, say, an open source software community, they've managed to build basically a base of volunteers around software development and so on. Another question I get related to both your questions is, well, who's going to maintain this? Right, like maybe I can release my, everyone knows software is dead in a year if you don't sort of update it or, or whatnot and keep it alive. Um, so one thing, so, that, so this is just, maybe it's a crazy idea, but one thing that occurs to me is we haven't done a particularly good job of allowing communities to develop around scientific problems and code. And, if, and, and when I talk to people who are more in, you know, computer communities and not necessarily in academic communities, they're so excited about many of the problems that we work on and so interested in it. And they've got extra cycles. So it's very much like the idea that started um, open source software. So maybe if we use tools to allow those communities to develop, that could be something that does more code maintenance um, and, and sucks up some of the manpower. But so far we've been, you know, we share code. I mean, this is how I've done it. Like you, you know, make a tarball throw it on your website, right? Like, it's, how do people get back to you with bugs? How do you talk to others who are interested in this problem? So we haven't, at least, you know, I don't want to criticize anyone but myself, but, but we haven't done as good a job as say, I mean, we could learn from them, uh, from open source software community. And they also, uh, for example, do a lot with testing, like we were talking about, that's integrated into how they operate and how they deal with code, whereas we haven't, we haven't done that as a community. One related point I want to just throw in there is that this, whole idea of like making your code available and having somebody reproduce it is not um, rare at all in say bringing drugs to the FDA. So the FDA regulatory body requires this. So my statistician friends who work in drug companies and have heard me talk about this problem are like what are you talking about? Of course our code has to be reproducible. but we have to hand it over to the FDA statisticians who are going to rerun things and make sure that you know everything we've done in, in including the data matches to what we say it is. So it's not a rare thing. Um, I mean, it's not an impossible thing. It's happening in places where it's demanded and also where they have perhaps the money and the manpower yeah, to make I mean, sure it, it happens. It sounds like things are being stretched out in time, though. 
where this right. I mean, so it I, has to, I mean, exactly. It almost, it's a quality quantity kind of question. I, I, I was thinking, you know, if you if you put the reproducibility up before the publication, obviously it's going to take longer for the publication to get out there. And so it, it's a question of like the speed of the science being slowed down at the expense of quality, and maybe that's a good thing. I, you know, I, but there's a trade-off. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, and it seems to me that it's the concept of community here, the intellectual community, that seems to be very important. That basically there has to be a coalition, a coalescing of a large number of people with enough resource in order to decide that this is a piece of science that needs to be is worth doing. Yeah, um, no, that's exactly right. So another project that I did that I obviously didn't have time to talk about is, well, what are the problems when people want to release code and data and so on? So this is worthy of an entire talk, this survey. So without giving you all the details that you need, people are concerned. It takes so much time to clean it up and document, deal with questions from users. And then there's one, competitors might get an advantage. So I think this also speaks to your point about community. People, when I did this survey, I gave lots of opportunities for folks to comment. And one, one, I remember clearly one person wrote back, yeah, sure, I'll open my code and data. It's a great idea, but I'll do it when, like, you know, Jim down the hall does it. You know, it's something that really is not something, because it is costly personally. And if you don't see the immediate payoff, why should, if you're going for tenure, why would you sacrifice a paper or two to do this? Now, I, I have counter arguments for all of that, and I still think it's worth it, but I can see how people would think that. Yeah. I think one thing to keep in mind is that very little uh, science, very few articles are of interest to anybody. Right? There's all these there's millions of journals, people are always starting to yeah. journals, yeah. and practically none of those articles are ever read, maybe by one person. Maybe the referee doesn't even read it. I think some of my favorites are not read by But uh, so it's really, there's only a small proportion of results that really need to be checked. Yeah, that's a good point. So that speaks to the, the discussion earlier about, well, where does reproducibility happen, right? Does it happen post-publication when, you know, you, these guys' papers are going to be um, going towards clinical trials? So maybe, that, maybe it was the right process in the sense of um, Baggerly et al. getting on board at the right time, but maybe it was something to do with the communication and the fact that they couldn't get that view out and those clinical trials just somehow went on that was the problem. So I'm not 100% sure, but that's what your, your, your point would fit with that explanation. Excuse me. It seems like there are actually sort of two different aspects to that. One is sort of, should you be meticulous from the very beginning, keep track? So the excuse of saying, well, I can't be bothered with putting everything nicely together for submission, you know, that's one thing. But the other, the ones that the big scandals we hear about, whether it's this one or a lot of other ones, it's actually intentional. It could have started out with sloppy or mistakes, but once somebody else raised the question for them or their supervisor or their department or university or whatever to say, we don't want to touch it. Let's try and hope that this Plus, we'll just die out and we will get our money and get our clinical trials. Even though, you know, it's all based on very shaky claims. I think, you know, this raises more the bioethics issue. And, you know, whether it's scientists or business people, I think that's a much more fundamental issue. And who should be looking at that? Yeah, that's a good question. I would like well, to Well, of course, you are actually <laughs> well, I mean, involved in I'm that. certainly not the only one, right? Um, uh, but yeah, I don't really know where the responsibility lies. Like this um, IOM committee, one of the things they're concerned about is FDA did approve. I think they approved two of the trials, and no one really knows what happened on the third or something, something like that. Um, so they're looking at, well, what were our standards there? Maybe, maybe we should take some of that blame. I think one of them was approved by another body. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, no, I know. I, I think I think that's exactly right. That once you start kind of peeling back the onion, there's there's a lot of stuff going on. Scary. Can I just I bring so. up one line? It's not there, which is the whole human subjects issue. So okay. here in PI, you know, we're all dealing with people, or most of us are dealing with people, and you know, we've got HIPAA breathing down our throat for everything, and so you know, when you talk about making data available, it makes so many people cringe that, you know, or, or say that's impossible because, you know, we didn't get 
consent yeah. from the 20 people in my study who yeah. make my data yeah, yeah, yeah. available. No, that's right. So um, there's no question that I'm not standing here advocating that as a rule we have to make everything open, <laughs> including all confidential data. But um, so that's so basically so so this was the neural information processing. So there, it's a prestigious conference in the machine learning world, and they have it's neural information processing. So they do have some like neuroscience they do and some medical stuff and medical folks are involved. And so this is the HIPAA type things that they would need to to verify to release. But um, but in the grand landscape of computational science, those that's not. It's sort of a special case of the data. Like it's not something that needs to prevent the um, openness going forward in other, in other types of data. But certainly, of course, there's lots of data that are confidential that will never be released. That's interesting because I have a, the opposite idea that the fact that we have these huge databases that actually uh, increases uh, the possibility that you are actually going to identify somebody, for example, yeah, yeah. with the genomics yeah, data. That's right. uh, it has been uh, published that you can actually identify your subject, the, the identified subjects uh, based mm -hmm. on their genomics data with minimal information. Yeah. So uh, actually, uh, it would have been easier to argue for open data 20 years ago than it is now, because 20 years ago. It's that that's the possible. Identification works. Right. Yeah. Now but, we but, um, well, don't forget again, speaking about open data in general, it may be things like you have an image processing algorithm and you're compressing images a certain way, and maybe you should release the image data that you based your algorithmic results on. So it's not necessarily data that can identify anyone, right? right. But in, in the context of uh, medical data, of course, right? So that's something where there's um, very real privacy concerns that people are dealing with. So there are some, like, this is all very new work, but people are thinking about ways of doing um, releasing data, but only such that you can um, query it in such a way with noise so that it isn't linked and so on. But it, it's brand new open questions. And you know, a lot of the genome data is out there. So. Yes, I think yeah. it, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> so we don't have to debate it's too much. much. Yeah, some people are doing it and others are actually suing. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not just genome okay. data. Like, for example, um, uh, if you or you have access to social security data, you can link that up with um, other types of government data and so on. So this, the linkage issue is something that we're confronting for sure. On the other hand, there's certainly um, new science that comes from linking orthogonal data sets or data sets that you think might not be related. You can sometimes uncover advantage discoveries that way. So, confident, so co the confidentiality would might maybe be a stopping point there, but there's many benefits to that type of thing too when confidentiality isn't a concern. Uh, it's not just the uh, confidentiality, sometimes it's uh, the human subject's uh, intention. Uh, we know it very well that uh, we can use <coughs> consent, somebody in the, the <coughs> I don't consent to some specific uh, aim. And yeah. even probably uh, giving it out to a reviewer uh, might actually violate that. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that, that's right. So for this, actually, I went through IRB for that because I was interviewing people. and. Um, yeah, you're not going to get me mounting a big argument about, um, you know, abrogating uh, patient consent. Well, in the um, um, statistical institutes, they have subcommittees where people specifically worry about confidentiality, privacy, release of data, and then others actually work on ways how to cut out pieces of it before mm -hmm. you, you release to share, so it's not as if that you have to give out everything. Yeah. But of course, you know, that could be a profession by itself. It, it is, right? So many people in computer science departments, they work on sort of data, recovery of data. Um, I, think, I think some people have been surprised by um, the linkage that people have been able to do with data that seemingly came online independently. And that's a, that's a new twist that people are confronting on the problem. So you can carry out, say, these methods of ensuring a particular data set is confidential, but I think it's Netflix that was one example, right? So they put out the Netflix data set, and people were very quickly able to, like, I think it was Latanya Sweeney, who's a computer science professor in Carnegie Mellon, um, who was able to recover the materials I think are important. Um, another thing that's happening, too, is open review process. So this is a little bit different, I think, in theme than what I've been talking to, to you about so far, but I think it, um, it's interesting in the journal policy discussion in terms of publishing um, review letters that were sent out and publishing responses, anonymous people very quickly just by linking to other data sets that Netflix hadn't thought about, FISA code and so on. So, yeah. But, you know, that's these, I, don't, I don't see any of these problems as barriers stopping 
everything. They're special cases that can be dealt with in special ways. I just have one more quick question if you had data on it. So you mentioned the NIH sort of requiring mm -hmm. large studies to make their data available. Any evidence that people are doing that? I don't have data on that. That would be a very interesting thing to study. Yeah, I would be very interested. And I would be very interested on, um, you know, grant renewals if you don't and stuff like that. They do uh, make available some genomics data, yes. Genomics data, but I'm just, I mean, it, it would be any study. Right. A large but these clinical are, trial. These are under, under the same policy. Right. Yeah, just the Genomics data has already this openness field. I mean, the clinical trial. Is that really making it public? So they have to make it easy to find, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. And thank you.